know, I only have Owen and Chris. So, I have what? Owen and Chris. Oh, I'm going to buy from the bed. Hey, uh, well, no. Oh, no. I already sold them right there. No. Hey. Alright. Come on. You should have brought the dogs earlier, Shady. place we like to start is with the key for the map. So let's take a look at the key for this map. All the blue states here granted full woman's suffrage before 1920. What is women's suffrage, you guys? Uh, women not being able to vote. That's right. Women's voting rights. When we talk about women's suffrage, we're talking about giving women the right to vote. So here in the blue states, full women's suffrage was granted before 1920. In the yellow states, partial women's suffrage was granted before 1920. And in the pink states, no women's suffrage was granted until after ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Our first question is, which region led the way in granting women's suffrage? So you can write that down. What region would you say was the most progressive in granting women's suffrage. The second question is, based on the map, what region would you suggest had the least amount of campaigning for women's suffrage? So go ahead and write that down. Let's make our decision. <coughs> <laughs> See the whiteboard's good for that too. Okay, volunteer number one, who would like to answer? Or I'll call on somebody. What do you think, Trey? What number one? What region would you say that is? The western region, the western states. These are our pioneer states. These are the ones that were territories before they became states. So. The population was lower than states on, uh, you know, more east of the Mississippi, and they needed everyone they had in order to make a functioning society. So they probably valued contributions of women more in the western states than they did throughout the rest of the country. Very good. <coughs> Question number two. Based on the map, what region would you suggest had the least amount of campaigning for women's suffrage? <coughs> Eleanor, are you thinking this one? Yeah. I thought you raised your hand. Yeah, east. Go ahead. Is that <laughs> <laughs> Which states uh, were had the least amount of campaign? Would you say for women's suffrage? The east coast. Like all those states. Are all ones in red. And what region of the country would that be? Go ahead, okay, Ethan. Right. Let's hear what you have to say. I want to hear your answer. Huh? The east and the southeast. So primarily in the heavy, heavily populated areas on the east coast where the centers of power are. We've got Washington, D.C., New York City, the center of commerce for the world, basically. And in the south, they were resistant to this progressive change of allowing women the right to vote. So it's not very surprising about the South, since they're always resistant to change or anything progressive. And lots of hard battles had to be fought and won in that region of the country. OK, you guys can wipe down your whiteboards. Put them back in the center of the table, please. On your table, there's a reading that looks like this. Go ahead and grab one of those. shall read together today because we're a family 
That's why we don't laugh at anyone that mispronounces words, because sometimes if you've never seen a word before, you don't know how to pronounce it. So give everybody a break, okay? Okay, I'm going to kick it off, and then I'm going to call on somebody to read the next three paragraphs, and then they're going to call on somebody else to read the next three paragraphs, and so on until we read this article. Here we go. Are you ready? Kicking it off. How women won the right to vote. In 1848, a small group of visionaries started a movement to secure equal rights for women in the United States. But it took more than 70 years just to win the right for women to vote. After male organizers excluded women from attending an anti-slavery conference, American abolitionist Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott decided to call the first Women's Rights Convention. Held over several days in July 1848 uh, at Seneca Falls, New York, the convention brought together about 300 women and 40 men. Among them was Charlotte Woodward, a 19-year-old farm girl who longed to become a printer, a trade then reserved for males. By the end of the meeting, convention delegates had approved a statement modeled after the Declaration of Independence. The Seneca Falls quote-unquote Declaration of Sentiments began with these words, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Okay, let me call on Evelyn. Would you read the next three paragraphs, please? Thank you. The Declaration then listed repeated injuries by men against women, claiming that men had imposed an absolute tyranny over women. These injuries included forcing women to obey laws that they had no voice in passing. They included making married women civilly dead in the eyes of the law without rights of property, earned wages, or to the custody of their children in a divorce. The injuries included bearing, barring women from the most profitable employment and colleges. The convention also voted on a re resolution that said it is the duty of the women of this country to secure themselves their sacred right to vote. This resolution provoked heated debate, it barely passed. In the middle of the 19th century, most Americans, included most women, accepted the idea of se separate spheres for males and females. Men worked and ran the government. Women stayed home and cared for the family. This notion was based on the widely held assumption that women were, by nature, de delicate, childlike, emotional, and mentally inferior. Okay, it says, by nature, <laughs> delicate, childlike, emotional, and mentally inferior to men. Now, in my life experience, I think we could flip that around and probably say that men are more delicate, childlike, emotional, and mentally inferior to women. Because the women I've known, I, women are just smarter than men, in my humble opinion, in my 53 years on this earth. So. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, Evelyn, please choose the next reader, please. Alyssa, the next three paragraphs, please. Now we're going to skip this shaded one at the bottom and then the next two on the page in the back, okay? See where it says continue on next page. We'll go ahead. But go ahead and start in the United States. So just do this one and then. Yeah, no. yeah, skip that one at the bottom. In the United States and in other democratic countries, the right to vote, also called the elective franchise or suffrage, remained exclusively within men's sphere. The Seneca Falls Declaration promoted a radical vision of gender equality in all areas of American public life, including women's suffrage. Women in most states did not gain the right to vote until 1919 after the role in American society had dramatically changed. Women the equity and the women's suffrage movement. One of the main leaders of the women's suffrage movement was Susan B. Anthony. But brought up in a Quaker family, she was going to be independent and think for herself. She joined the abolitionist movement to end slavery. Through her abolitionist efforts, she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Stanton in 1851. Anthony had not attended the Seneca Falls Convention, but she quickly joined the Stanton to lead the fight for women's suffrage in the United States. The Civil War interrupted action to secure the vote for women. During the war, however, the role of women in society began to change. Since many men were fighting, their wives and daughters often had to run a family farm, going to work in factories or take up other jobs previously done by them. 
Thank you, Alyssa. Very good. So here before the Civil War, this movement had already started, but because of the interruption of the war and it kind of got lost and swept under the carpet. But you can see here, since the men were off fighting, the women had to step up and fulfill those roles in society that were previously done by men, thus changing their position in society for the better, probably, making them more uh, self-reliant and independent. Thank you, Alyssa. Pick our next reader, please. Um. After the war. After the war, Anthony Stanton and others hoped that because women had contributed to the war economy, they, along with the ex-slaves, would be guaranteed the right to vote, but most males dis disagreed. The Republicans who controlled Congress wrote three new amendments to the U.S. Constitution. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment awarded citizenship to all people born within the United States, and granted every person the equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment dealt with voting it stated the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It failed to grant women the right to vote. In 1869, Anthony and Stanton organized the National Women's Suffrage Association to work for a federal constitutional amendment guaranteeing all American women the right to vote. Some activists disagreed with this ta tactic. They delivered they believed the best way to get the vote for women was to persuade the legislators of the state to grant women suffrage. Very good. Thank you, Hadley. So here it is. In the Congress of the United States of America, the freest country in the world, here they were emancipating the slaves and giving slave males or former slave males the right to vote, but women were still being denied the right to vote. Someone said uh, first hour today that perhaps our country has a bigger problem with sexism than they do with racism. So that's something to consider as we read these points and go on. Good to have you. Uh, choose the next reader, please. Ironically. Uh, yes, ironically, yes. Ironically, the first place to allow American women to vote was neither the federal government nor a state. In 1869, the male, all-male legislator of the territory of Wyoming passed a law that permitted every adult woman to cast her vote and hold office. In the West, pioneer women often worked shoulder to shoulder with men on farms and ranches and thus proved they were not equal or inferior. Meanwhile, in Rochester, New York, Anthony conspired with sympathetic male voting registrars. registrars who allowed her and other women to cast ballots in the 1872 presidential election. The following year, she was put on trial for illegally voting a criminal offense. The judge at Anthony's trial ruled that because she was a woman, she was incompetent to testify. A jury found her guilty and the judge ordered her to pay a fine of $100. Anthony told the judge she would never pay it. She never did. In 1875, in the case of Minor, Minor and Happer Set, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that women were citizens in the 14th Amendment, but the court went on to say that citizenship did not mean women automatically possessed the right to vote. Good. So here's our own Supreme Court saying, that yeah, even though you guys are citizens, like little kids aren't allowed the right to vote either. So they're kind of pigeonholing women into a more childlike position in society. Here's uh, Susan B. Anthony. They even made a dollar coin in 1979 with her image on it. There's not too many of them around nowadays, but they were when I was a kid. Here she is, a college educated woman, raised as a Quaker, and in her own trial, about her voting illegally. She wasn't even allowed to testify in her own behalf. Does that remind you of another marginalized group in our history that was not allowed to testify in their own behalf in the court of law? So basically half the country, the women of the country were uh, segregated into a non-voting class of citizens. Very good, Trey. Uh, our next reader, please. Jason. Jason. 
1978, the NWSA succeeded in getting a constitutional amendment to the in Congress. The proposed amendment stated the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This became known as the Anthony Amendment. While NWSA lobbied Congress for the Anthony Lee Amendment, another advocacy yeah, group, the American Women's Suffrage Association, concentrated on campaigning for women's rights to vote in states and territories. Before 1900, only a few of these efforts in the Western Territory succeeded. When the territory of Wyoming applied for statehood in 1889, Congress threatened to deny it admission because its laws allowed women to vote. In response, the territorial legislators wrote Congress, we will remain out of the Union 100 years rather than come in without the women. The following year, Congress admitted Wyoming as a state. The first one was women's suffrage. This set the trend for a few other Western states to pass women's suffrage laws. Colorado, 1893, Utah, 1896, and Idaho, 1893. So here we go. We owe it to the, the territory of Wyoming for standing up to Congress because the territory becoming a state was a big deal. And here they are saying, we will remain out 100 years if we can't come with our women. So, uh, in fact, they got the ball rolling and other Western states began to follow as they came to the Union, giving women the right to vote upon the inception of statehood. So, kudos to them for being progressive in their mindfulness. But like we said, there's less people out West, and they needed everybody they had to help make their population grow. So... Okay, good. Kaysen, pick our next reader, please. David. David. In 1890. In 1890, the two national women's suffrage organizations merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association with Elizabeth, Elizabeth Katie Stanton uh, as the president. Susan B. Anthony took over in uh, 1892 and remained president until she retired in 1900. In the late 1800s, the Women's Christian Temperancy Union was actually the largest national organization prompting women's suffrage. The WCTU led a home protection movement aimed at prohibiting strong drink because of its damaging effects on women on, their, on men and their families. WCTU uh, leaders realized that to, uh, that, uh, that to increase its influence and affect lawmakers, women needed to be able to vote. <coughs> White and middle class women dominated the WCTU, NAWSA, and most other national women's groups. The groups usually rejected black women for fear of alienating. Alienating. White supporters in the racially segregated South. In addition, the groups rarely uh, recruited immigrant women. The failure uh, to include all women in the movement, while politically expanded, uh, undermine the cause. Okay, good. Thank you very much, David. So here it is. These are the most progressive groups in our country at the time. They're fighting for this radical idea of giving women the right to vote, yet they don't include women of color or recent immigrants in the country. So it kind of shows you, it's indicative of how deep the, the problem ran in our society that in order to be a success, they couldn't include everybody. They just had to keep the white middle class women at the forefront of the movement in order to draw support from the men that held all the power in government. Very good, Daylin. Uh, please select the next reader, please. Lily. Lily, towards the turn. <coughs> towards the turn of the 20th century, Congress draws its consideration of the Anthony Amendment and in the state constitutes to grant women the right to vote for heavy opposition from traditional and overbearing interests contributed to these defects. Mm -hmm. The concept of a new America woman emerged after 1900 writers and 
commentators. commentators. Commentators described the new woman as independent and well educated. She wore loose fitting she wore loose fitting clothing, played sports, drove an automobile and even smoked in public. She supported charities and social reformers including women's suffrage. She often chose to work outside the home and office department stores and profession such as journalism, law, and medicine that were just opening up to women. The image of the new woman also usually made her white, native-born, and middle class. By 1910, feminist was another term for being used to describe the new woman. Feminists referred to the new spirit among a few middle-class women to liberate themselves from old notion of separate spheres and only feminist writer commanded this traditional view of the role of women since it prevented their full development and robbed the nation of their potential contribution. Very good, Lily. Thank you for doing that. So here it is, the concept of the new woman. She worked outside the home. Well, this new woman was white and middle class usually. But the idea of working outside the home was a real innovation for our American society at the time. And so it went on uh, morphing from the term new woman into the term we kind of use nowadays, which is feminism, which is a man or a woman that promotes the rights of women in society. Very good, Lily. Will you pick the next reader, please? Who? You want me to read some? Okay. Let's see. Uh, Aiden, would you read uh, starting there with, of course, the bottom of page three? Of course, working outside the home was nothing new for poor white immigrants and black women. They followed as housekeepers and factory workers and had a menial job in order to survive. Female factory workers only earned only a quarter to a third of what men earned for the same job. There were no sick days or health benefits. Women were known to have given birth on the floors of the factories where they worked. Since they did not have the right to vote, they had little opportunity to pressure lawmakers to pass laws that could improve their wages and working conditions. Western states continued to lead the way in grant, grant, granting women suffrage. Washington state allowed women the right to vote in 1910. California followed in 1911. Arizona, Kansas, and Oregon passed the laws the next year. The presidential election of 1912 saw the two major parties, the Republicans and Democrats, opposing women's suffrage. But the 1912 election featured two major independent parties, the Progressives, led by former Republican President Theodore Roosevelt, and the Socialists, led by Eugene Debs. Both the Progressives and Socialists favored women's suffrage and were treated about one third of the votes cast. Okay, so the argument was that, hey, uh, the Republicans and Democrats opposed suffrage, but here we have this new progressive party led by a very charismatic leader, Theodore Roosevelt, and also the Socialist Party led by Eugene Debs, who had a major showing in the election of 1912, and then their platforms was the idea of giving women the right to vote. And they still got one third of the vote anyway, so maybe women's suffrage wasn't all bad. Thank you, Aiden. Could you pick the next reader, please? Ethan. Ethan, go for it. Alice Paul. Alice Paul Hurdid, uh, and Taylor W. Wolf as a effort to lobby Congress to consider, again, the and the amendment brought up as a Quaker Paul, uh, 1885 to 1937, graduated from Swarth Swarthmore College. It sounds very prestigious. Swarthmore College and received postgraduate degrees in social work. Traveling to Great Britain, she encouraged radical feminists demanding the right to vote. She joined them in hunger strikes and in demonstrations. On returning to the United States, she joined the NAWSA. Uh, in 1913, the 28th of Paul organized a massive parade in Washington, D.C. Also, crowds of men attacked the marchers who had to be protected by the National Guard. Paul and the president of NAWSA, uh, Terry Chapman, had disagreed over using public demonstrations to involve women suffrage. Uh, Chad had grown up in the Midwest, graduated from Iowa State College, and gone on to work as a teacher, high school principal, and superintendent of a school district, one of the first women to hold such a job. She worked tirelessly for women's causes, and in 1900, she was elected to 
Okay, good. Thank you, Ethan. So here's this future leader of the NAWSA had traveled to England, and that's where she kind of got indoctrinated in these radical techniques like hunger strikes <coughs> and protesting with uh, strikes and demonstrations. She brought those ideas back to America and joined up with the other women that were already trying to win the vote in the country. Very good, Ethan. Pick our next reader, please. Go ahead, Colton. Text tactics, tactics contrasting sharply with calls. She preferred to quietly lobby lawmakers in Congress and the state legislators. All favored demonstrations, both leaders, however, were dedicated to equal rights for women. In the election of 1916, Katz supported Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's running was running on the slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. All opposed Wilson. She voided his slogan saying parody, parody. Parody his slogan saying Wilson kept us out of suffrage. Paul broke with the MW NAWS <coughs> and founded the National Women's Party. Soon afterwards she organized daily picketing of the White House to pressure President Wilson to support the Anthony Amendment. After the United States entered World War I in 1917, Paul kept up the picketing. The women demonstrators silently carried signs and slogans like democracy should be beginning at home and Kaiser Wilson. Onlookers assaulted the White House, picketers calling them traitors for insulting the wartime president. Okay, so these, these ladies were picketing even before the war started, but once this <coughs> war started, public sentiment was like, hey, we're in the middle of a war, it's un American of you to be insulting or criticizing our president. So actually, uh, during this time, a lot of crowds of men came in and were actually beating this, these women. They were protesting outside the White House. And the cops would stand by and do nothing about it because it's a patriarchal society. We've come from a patriarchal society for thousands of years. And here in America, with the help of these women fighting for the right to vote, we've advanced ourselves past that idea that women aren't equal to men and don't have a lawful place in society that's equal to them. Very good. Uh, Colton, please pick our next victim, if you would. BJ. BJ. So let's see. In June 1917. In June 1917, police began arresting figures for parking the sidewalks. About 270 were arrested and almost 100 were jailed, including Paul. She and the others in jail went on hunger strikes. Large force fed women hunger strikers by jamming feet and feet down their throats. The forced feeding was reported in all the major newspapers. Embarrassed by the publicity, President Wilson pardoned and released them. Meanwhile, women replaced men by the thousands in the war industry and many other types of jobs previously held by men. In 1921, made up 25% of their of the entire labor force of the country. President Wilson was disturbed that the push for women's suffrage was causing division during the war. He, al he was also deeply impressed by Gary Chapman's map. In January 1918, he announced his support for the Anthony Amendment. By this time, 17 states as well as Great Britain had granted women the right to vote. Wilson's support helped build momentum for the Amendment. In the summer of 1919, the House and Senate approved the 19th Amendment by a margin well beyond the required two-thirds majority. Then the amendment had to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. Okay, thank you, BJ. Nice. So here he is, President Wilson. He's a politician, right? He was initially against the idea of women's suffrage, but once this newspaper article <coughs> came out, it kind of shamed him it made him look bad, the fact that these hundred women that were arrested for obstructing the sidewalk were thrown into jail, beaten by the guards, and when they went on a hunger strike, they forced tubes down their throats and forced nutrients into their bodies. So this helped Wilson, as a politician, see that he was on the losing side of things, and he switched his position in 1918 
uh, asking the Congress to go ahead and approve the amendment, and which they did. But it needs to be ratified by three fourths of the states. Now, remember back to our map, it's going to be a tough haul. Yes, they might be well out west, but as you get further east, there's going to be more and more resistance to the idea of giving women the right to vote. All right, BJ, it's your choice. Who's going to read next for us? Who's going to take us all the way out of this article? Aaron. Okay, Aaron. Those opposed to women's suffrage, the so called anti anti assembled all their forces to stop ratification. The liquor and brewing of the fumes, factory windows, railroad banks, and bridges to the home of cities all fear. Women were built for progressive reforms, southern whites objected to more black labor. Some argued that the 19th Amendment invaded state rights, others claimed that it would undermine family unity. In fact, the antis said wives were already represented at the ballot box by the nation. But state after state ratified the amendment, which one last state needed for ratification. The Tennessee <coughs> legislature voted on the amendment. The outcome depended on the vote of the youngest men in the Tennessee state legislature. He voted for ratification, but only after receiving a letter from his mother urging him to be a good boy and support women's suffrage. Thus, on August 18, 1920, half the adult population of the United States won the right to vote. Women voted nationwide for the first time in the presidential election of 19. Among the new voters were 91-year-old Charlotte Woodward, the only surviving member of the Santa Falls Convention. In her life, um, she had witnessed a revolution in the role of women in American society. Okay, so very good. Thank you, Erin. So here it is. Even though Congress overwhelmingly passed this thing, it had a real struggle getting that three-fourths of the states to ratify it. And here, in the final outcome, is the state of Tennessee, their youngest legislator, who at that, that time was the age of 24, he received a letter from his mother, and she went on, here, while you're in the big city, you to buy these things for me at the store, and oh, by the way, why don't you be a good boy and vote for women's suffrage? And that's what changed his mind, was his mother asking him to do it. Because before this, he was staunchly against the idea of women getting the right to vote. So like I said, no one gave women the right to vote. These women put their lives on the line to fight for that right. And this is so appropriate to have a fan play while I'm saying this. I'd like to thank Mr. Poyer for giving us this article to study today. I would have never known about it if it wouldn't been for him. So what I'd like you to do now, we've all read this thing through and through, front to back. I'm going to assign you a position, whether you're for the Anthony Amendment or against the Anthony Amendment. Let me do that right now. What you're going to do 